right? Because he's one of the Dallas Storytelling Guild's newest members. And he got to know us before he joined. <laughs> and he still joined. We arrived. <laughs> My friend. see you guys, but I know that you're there. <laughs> My name is Michael Grundy. I'm not from Texas. I'm really from Kansas, but uh, they tell me that uh, the proper thing to say is I'm not from Texas, but I got here as quick as I could. <laughs> <laughs> I got here as quick as I could. I want to tell you a story that I have called Stage Fright. Stage Fright. When I was in college, I went to a college called Emporia State University, a small college in Kansas. And when I was in college, I had the best job a college student could possibly have. I was a security guard. I had a uniform, a blue jacket, black pants, and a policeman's cap. I carried a walkie-talkie, flashlight, and a little clock. A strange little clock that would be on the side of my waist, I didn't hear it. And my job was simply to inspect the buildings. See, this was long before we had alarms and videos to watch. And my job was to go to every building on the campus and make sure that each one of those was secure. Now, they had a wild way of doing this, an ingenious method. The system required that, well, I bet some of you have even seen this, but for the young folks, there would be a little metal plate pinned on the wall, and attached to that would be a metal chain. And at the end of the metal chain would be a key. And my job was to take that key, stick it into a little box I wore in my hip that had a clock inside, and turn that key. And what that would do would let the people know that someone had been at that spot in that building at a particular time. That really sounds crude when you think about the kind of arms that we have today, but that was the my job as a security guard. Now, they were really smart because they wanted to make sure that I didn't just stick my head in and, and say that, oh, the room was cool. So those keys would be placed in strategic places, like at the very, very back corner of the room or way down the hall around the corner to make sure that you really had to walk through the whole building and inspect the whole building and turn. And it wasn't a bad job because we didn't have a lot of buildings on my small campus. But we did have one building that was a problem, and that building was the speech building. See, in the speech department we had, well, we had a haunted theater. The stage, that whole auditorium, they said, was haunted. And I always tried to make sure that I didn't have to be you know, in that building late at night because it was haunted. Now, they said that if you were around there late at night, you would hear the sounds of clapping and laughter and jeering and all of the sounds that were going with the theater. But no one ever seen where the sounds actually came from. Well, I talked to an old janitor who had been around for a long time. And the old janitor told me a story and explained to me why the fear was haunted. He told me that it was haunted with the ghost of one of the early students at that university. It was the first black student that had attended that university back in 1940s. This was his ghost that was still haunting the fear. See, back in the 1940s when this kid had went to school, you know how kids can be. The other kids weren't real friendly with him. They didn't really like him a lot, and they would pick on him and bully him with him. And they can have all types of pranks. And even got to the point where they would do vicious things, like they began to poison his food. Now this guy, he really, really, really loved that speech department. And he loved to debate. He loved to act, and he just loved to give speeches. His ideal thing, his hero was Paul Roberson, and he had a dream that he would give great speeches and be a great actor. But his colleagues, his peers, they wanted him to 
take other small parts and minstrel roles or to paint his face up in blackface and do, do roles that he didn't think were up to standard. So he decided he was going to be a speaker. He was going to be a debater and a great actor. And one day, the janitor told me that one day while he was giving a speech, in the middle of the speech, he all of a sudden began to sweat. He began to shake. His knees began to knock. And he got extremely frightened. His stomach ached and he died right there on the stage. Right there on the stage, he died. And all the kids just laughed and jeered and threw things at him while he was dying. And as he died, he, with his dying words, he cursed those students. He cursed them and told them that because of their meanness of being so evil, that any time they approached that stage for a debate, for acting, or to give a speech, any time they would, didn't feel the same thing that he had felt. And they would begin to have a queasy feeling in their stomach. Their knees would begin to shake. They would begin to sweat and perspire, and they would be too scared to even perform on that stage. And he cursed him and said, none but my own, none but my own will ever succeed on this stage. And they say for weeks after that, for months after that, whenever any student would get up on that stage for a debate or to act or do some, something on that stage, that curse would be upon him. And they would be frightened as could be. The knees would shake. They'd sweat. The stomach would just feel like butterflies were flopping off on the side. And it got so bad that they ended up closing down the theater. That theater stayed closed not for months, not for years, but for decades. No one would come to that campus and give a speech. The great Martin Luther King, he came there in the 60s, and he just dropped off a letter and went up the road to speak at another <laughs> Because he didn't even want to go to that theater. It was a spooky, haunted theater. Now, by the time I got this, it was in the 70s, and so by the time I got up there, you know, my speech teacher, he decided that, you know, that was a bunch of bunk. He said he didn't believe all those stories about that place being haunted. And our school had gone much too long without having plays and, and debates and, and people singing on stage. And he decided that we needed to open that theater back up. We shouldn't be scared of ghosts and scared of our own shadows. And he decided that he would open the theater up. And we would have debates and plays and speech runoffs. And he scheduled each tournament, where we would all come give our speeches in the new theater. <coughs> but the night before, the night before, I was on my security guard duty, and I had this little three-wheel motorcycle. They call it a cushion. I don't know if some of you are familiar with those motorcycles, but it's sort of like a golf cart. Not very wild, but I could go all over campus as well as off campus, too. And that particular day, you know, I was having a good time. I had been over hanging out with some girlfriends, and I had been drinking with some partners, and I was in uniform, and that wasn't really very good. And all of a sudden, I noticed that as the clouds rolled in, and it got a little bit darker, that I was off schedule. And I had to get back to on campus and check out all the buildings. And normally, the speech building was one that I saw in the daytime. And I had let the sun go. And now I had to go in and inspect the speech department. I was scared. But I had to go. And you can imagine how things can be in the daylight, but at not nighttime, that same little creak on the floor, that same little shadow that you would never have been scared of, at night it can sure be magnified. And I walk down. <coughs> Inspecting that first floor. And I was going through each room and I'd go in, in the room. Every time I think I hear something, I flash my light. And I went and I turned the key in the first room, in the second room, in the third room, and all the way down the hall. 
I went to the second floor, and I did the same thing. But on the third floor, the third floor is where the theater was located. And by the time I got to the third floor, I I really didn't want to go. And these people were so smart that they had the key at the back, at the back of the backstage. I opened the big double decker doors, and you could hear those hinges crying from lack of oil for years and years and years. As I entered in, it smelled so musty. It's like the place had been closed up for years. Cobwebs hanging down, dust everywhere. Only light was my little pink flashlight. As I walked down the aisles, I would hear a noise. A rodent. Hear another noise, and nothing might be there. And every time I kept turning around looking to see if somebody was following, what was it? I slowly made my way to the front of the theater. I moved past the curtains and I looked out on the stage and out in that whole theater was populated with people. It was an audience. It was all kinds of weird people, dead people, zombie people, but it was an audience. It was an audience of people. And they were all laughing and talking and screaming and throwing things at the speaker. And the guy that was speaking. speaking and trying to get his point across, but they just wouldn't listen. And all of a sudden, he began to break out in a sweat and began to shake. And you could see him grab his stomach. And right then and there, he crumpled and he just fell right to the ground. And he began to die. I, I, I watched the people. Nobody got up to help him. Nobody came to his rescue. What was I to do? I, I jumped up. And of course, I went right there to him. And I went and I grabbed him. And, and I held his head in my arms, and, and I held him, and, and he cursed the audience. He cursed them and told them how they had mistreated him. And then he pulled me close, and he whispered into my ear, and he told me the secret. He shared that secret with me. And then he said those words, none but my own, none but my own. I didn't know what the heck was going on. I got up from that stage. I jumped into that orchestra pit. Oh, my God. I'm in the orchestra pit. I'm trying to swim through all of the music stands and the chairs, climbing my way out, running up and down that aisle. I get outside that door and pin myself up against the door because nobody needs to get out of this door. I was scared. I was scared. I was scared nearly to death. There's something going on in that in that auditorium. That theater is really, it really, really, really is haunted, just like they say. And he, he looked at me and, and laughed and, and didn't believe me. And said, no, we, we'll, we'll speak anyway. And we did. And I can remember when the 
was lying trying to understand. I was standing at the left, looking at the wings of the stage. The other children, the other students, the other speakers were hung over the together, scared to death. Their stomachs were bubbling and hurting. They were throwing up. They were sweating. They were sick. They had stage fright. And they couldn't speak. They would have rather been in the casket than doing the eulogy. They were scared. But I knew the secret. I knew the secret. And I stood and I told them the story of my grandfather. I told them how my grandfather had been the only student and the first student at the university and how he had been treated, and how he had wanted to dream of being a great actor, a great orator, and how he had been mistreated on that stage. And he had told me the secret. And now, as I finished my speech, and the blood began to trickle from the corner of my mouth, a cold wind through the theater. And you could hear that voice. None but my own. None but my own. Ha 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 ha